and in some situations i have seen the business model itself is a totally new model and customer is not sure of the success what happens customer will try to get the best price from you which means the lowest price from you instead of dropping your price you can change your total price model or price structure and say that i it's a kind of risk sharing model you can propose a risk sharing model where you grow with the customer Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the parallel relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving, and today our guest is Kota. Just like Cher, he only has one name. Not really, we'll hear more in a minute. Here are three things you wanna know about Kota before we start. He has been working in pricing for 17 years. I'm gonna to have to do the math to see how long I've been in this because that might be longer than me, Kota. Nice. He's been in many, many sectors, including polymers, oil and gas, telecom. And my favorite thing about him, he just got his US citizenship. All right, welcome Kota. Thanks Mark, great to be here. Okay, I just have to ask, totally personal, is it hard to get a U.S. citizenship? Usually it is hard, but for me, I, I think I got it very fast. And compared to any other uh, Indians, I got it like fast. For me, I did not really go through that difficulty. I'll assume that means you were very smart because I hear the history questions on those tests are much harder than anything most Americans can answer. Oh, you're talking about those questions? No, they're, yes. they're, really, easy. they're really easy. There are 100 questions you just have to read through once and then once or twice. It's really easy, no. I was think, thinking of something else, yeah. Excellent, so let's jump into pricing and let me ask you, how did you get into pricing? Yeah, I started my career in finance and I continued in finance for almost 13 years uh, in different roles. And once, I think that was in 2000, year 2003, when I was working for oil and gas sector, the company has started the pricing function in the corporate office and I was offered a job there in that in that team. So I immediately grabbed it, I jumped. I did not know what it was. I knew nothing about pricing at that time. So I joined that organization. That was a small team of, of four people for the entire company centrally located at the corporate office. And fortunately that company had multi-product. That, that was a multi-product company, multiple products are there. I started pricing in the monopoly, completely a natural monopoly like gas transportation, which is totally regulated. So I had, we had to follow some administrative pricing mechanism there. And then we also, I was also exposed to the pricing of polymers, which is totally competitive, which is uh, in the oligopoly sector, in the oligopoly, but it is totally value-based pricing. And then there are some things in between also. There are petrochemicals, a lot of products, which are gas extracts, and where we, are, we were following this next best alternative kind of pricing. So a lot of, a lot of fun working in that company. And I learned a lot. Yeah, let me push on both of those for just a second, because this is going to be fun. You've been involved in enough of my LinkedIn conversations to know I do not like the word commodity. And you just said you were pricing in a commodity. What do you do if you price a commodity? You just say, oh, there's the market price. I don't have to do anything. First of all, did I say commodity? Yeah, did you say, I, thought, oh, I thought so. <laughs> it was natural monopoly. It was natural monopoly. Gas transportation is a natural monopoly. It's different from the usual monopoly. Monopoly is when you don't have competition. But a natural monopoly is when you cannot have a competition. This is a gas transportation. So when you lay a pipeline from a point A to B, you cannot have a multiple pipelines there to just to encourage competition. It's, it's going to be only one, just like a road, just like a road. So it has to be regulated. Otherwise, it gives a lot of pricing power or, or negotiating power to the seller. Yes, yes. And so then since you're regulated, you're probably doing a lot of cost plus, not because it's the right thing to do, but because that's what the regulators force you to do. It's interesting. I thought it used to be usually cost plus, but it is really cost plus, but not cost plus of the, the seller. It is, it's like this. So you're allowed to have a certain margin like IRR, the post-tax IRR of 12%, let's say, for example, it used to be that 12% of post-tax and post-tax IRR of 12%. But that is not on the cost of the company. It is on the benchmark normative cost. So it is the industry's best cost. On that, you are allowed to have 12%. So it incentivizes you to be more efficient than the best in the industry. At the same time, it puts a penalty on you if you are not efficient. 
So at least there's incentives to become more and more efficient that way, which is nice. And yet there's still, you know, I come back to the fact that there's still no pricing intelligence behind that because I'm following formulas that I have to use. Yeah. As far as gas transportation is concerned, yes, there is no marketing. There is no, not much, even negotiation, there is no room for negotiations also with the customers. It has to be a government set price. Let's talk about the oligopoly business with the polymers then. And so one of the things that I find fascinating, and I've always heard this happens in the chemical industry, and I'd love to know from your side, since you've lived this, is we often see contracts where the cost of raw material is part of the contract. Is that consistent? No, no, not for polymers, at least not for polymers. Yeah, the polymers is uh, when I was doing pricing for polymers at that time, there was some gap between supply and demand. The supply was less than the total demand in the country. And there used to be some imports coming into the country. So our entire, uh, we used to call it as an import parity pricing. Basically, the imports are the next best alternatives for all the customers. And the, the structure of the industry where there are only three or four producers in the country, and then there are like six or 7,000 customers across the country. So prices used to be the internationally published prices. We used to keep track of those prices and set the import parity price just to prevent imports coming into the country or in a way they are comparable to the imports, imported price. But we used to do a lot of adjustments. And then we used to also have some premium and some discounts on the quality of the product, depending on the quality if our product is better than the competition we used to have premium, like you know, certain products we used to have. It's, yeah, interesting. Every month we used to change and first of every month, and there used to be huge, <laughs> it used to be a huge price list. Nice. And so the, the differentiation for the polymers, what was that? Because you said you get a, a premium for quality, but is that the only differentiator that we had? You called it quality? Yeah, it's quality, service, relationship, uh, the after sales service, the reliability, everything. But the, everything, but apart from that, we used to have a detailed conjoint analysis. Right? And then we used to get the feedback from all the customers. And based on that, we used to price our premiums, put our premium on the different rates. Nice. And I think not enough companies use conjoint analysis. It's such a powerful technique. Did you guys do that yourself or did you hire outside people to do it for you? It's an external consultant. Gallup, I, Gallup used to do that. Gallup used yeah. to do that. Nowadays, there are a bunch of companies that have uh, online software to do that pretty inexpensively and they'll hold your hand through it. I'm not sure the big companies do it that way, but I think a lot of small companies can get into it where they couldn't have before, Okay, which is I, really nice. Yeah, in telecom industry, I'm not... I'm not used to this conjoint analysis. I've been into telecom industry, right? This we don't follow that much here. Yeah. <laughs> there is a way to to track the customer. Um, I think what do we call it? Perceived value index. So customer perceived value index, but it's not exactly the conjoint analysis that we follow. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. Well, one of the things we said we were going to talk about was pricing models. And I'd love to hear, did you put together a framework in your mind for different types of pricing models? Or did you want to chat about a few different pricing models you've used? What's the high level of where we want to go? Yeah, this concept of price models is, I'm, I'm very fond of this price models because in telecom industry, when I joined telecom industry, I started, I got introduced to the price models. I never thought about it earlier, but this, when, when I'm pricing the telecom, it gives a lot of opportunities. Many times what happens, first of all, the nature of the deals in telecom are the huge large value deals and very complex customized solution. And when we put the price, usually it goes through several iterations, a lot of negotiations, including scope, cost, everything, terms and conditions, all that. But usually at some point in time, customer pushes for price reduction, right? What are the options for you? One way is you go anyway, you go present your value, try to defend your price. And then the other option is you just try, but still you have to move on price. And sometimes you have to offer discount. And if you just, if you have to just to meet the customer request for price reduction, the only option for you is to just reduce the price, which is not good. You're not doing any, you're doing a big disservice to your employer or to, to the company. So the best part is, there must be a reason why customer is pushing for price reduction. 
like you mentioned i've heard many times in your discussions the value conversations when you engage in the value conversation and exactly address the pain points that customer is going through i categorize those pain points into two categories two categories first one is the technical let's call it as technical pain points where for example a customer may have a huge power consumption as a problem that right? and they want to save on the power or they want to reduce their power consumption or they want to have some additional customer experience related issues which will ultimately generate additional revenue to the customer that is one part of new category that is a different part the pain point so you can address that through in your solution whatever is the product you have could be an innovative product you can address that the other part of these problems or pain points that customer has usually is the commercial related we may have issues with this opex budget he may have issues with this capex budget or he may have serious issues with his cash flow or he doesn't believe this is what i i mean learned over years in my experience and sometimes customer doesn't believe in your solution itself he agrees everything but he wants to try but he's not fully convinced or he's not sure so you have to put a different model in that case and in some situations i have seen the business model itself is a totally new model and customer is not sure of the success what happens customer will try to get the best price from you which means the lowest price from you instead of dropping your price you can you can change your total price model or price structure and say that i it's a kind of risk sharing model we have done that many times so you can propose a risk sharing model where you grow with the customer if the business is successful you get money if this is not successful you get, you get the minimum price so you are taking a risk you are putting your skin in the game it's a true partnership spirit and that way you can change so just to put names to the pricing models there are risk sharing model gain sharing models pay as you save or pay as you go and we can convert everything into a opex model or a capex model yeah different models are possible and that is where i thought yeah i hope i'm clear about price model right i did not define what price model is <laughs> i'm assuming that yeah time out for a quick ad if you're currently working in a subscription business i'm guessing this is what your world feels like oh my gosh the ceo just said we need to grow faster i already have too many things to do now what are we adding which of these things should i be doing if i only sleep 4 hours and i come in earlier i can get more done well Here's my advice. You can go with the flow and do what you're told. I mean, doing busy work and doing what other people tell you to do isn't the worst job in the world. After all, I used to dig ditches for a living. Or there's a better alternative. Take responsibility. You determine what drives your product's growth. When you choose the right activities and then execute them well, it boosts your career. To help you drive your product's growth, we put together a powerful online course called Accelerate Your Subscription Business. This course provides you the framework that helps you decide which of your tasks are most important right now. Most importantly though, it helps you think strategically about your subscription business, not just about your tactics. The course is only $500. What a tiny investment considering what this could do for your company and your career. To learn more, go to www.championsofvalue.com. I look forward to seeing you there. So let's take a step back for just a second. When I say the word price model, I tend to think of things like, oh, we're going to use a subscription-based price model or oh, we're going to use a freemium price model. or right and there's a whole army to sell by the unit or by the hour or by the right at the price limit yeah. the price yeah, is sure. the component of the price model is one of the components of the price model i would see the different a little different bit, difference between it's different from uh, price model price metric is one of the components i would say no, i'm completely with you and what i find fascinating about the answer that you just gave is you're really saying i'm going to create a price model per customer so i'm going to create a flexible price model structure so that when i go into a customer i have the value conversation i know what their pushbacks are their challenges are 
then I can structure my pricing model for that deal for what that customer needs. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You are spot on. No, there are some some issues here. The price metric, you, you cannot use any type of price metric. Sometimes you have measurability problems. So some price metrics you cannot measure the actual usage, then what then there is no use in deploying that price metric right in your model and you're using that price metric for example you can say my my price per let's say hd movies i'm just taking one example which is a neutral example of a cable provider they can charge it based on like unlimited model or number of hours viewed or just just hypothetical and it could be a hd or the speed total data downloaded anything is possible but if you cannot measure it, then there is no use in using that price metric. So it has to be measurable, number one, and it should align with customer revenue model. And that is important. Most important thing is it has to be aligned. For example, a customer is selling their data in unlimited buckets, and we want to charge price per GB. It doesn't work because customer is not getting his revenue on per GB basis then it has to be some other metric like price per subscriber or price per speed or experience or latency, something else. You know, I'm talking a mobile operator, mobile phone operator customer, yeah. This is pretty fascinating. I usually say, now we kind of shift our conversation from the pricing model, which I'm gonna get back to in a second, to the pricing metric. And what I usually, usually say on a pricing metric is it has to be aligned with the way our customers receive value. And essentially, it's, I guess I would say, parallel, consistent with, aligned with our customer revenue model. I liked your example that said, if they've got an all-you-can-eat model, I can't charge them for the unit. Or at least it's hard. They're, it makes them take more of a risk than they really want to take. If their revenue model is per user, I cannot have a per usage. I cannot charge them per usage. It has to be aligned to their revenue model, basically. Yeah. So I'll push back just a tiny bit on that. I wouldn't say that it, you can't charge that way. What I would say is that it's harder to charge that way because what we're doing is we're asking the customer to take more of a risk. But as another pricing expert that I love, Ron Brown, he goes, we get paid for taking risks. <laughs> he says, if you're not taking a risk, you're not going to get paid. So, you know, maybe... But, but yeah, the closer we get it aligned so that we're not forcing our customers to take unnecessary risks, the more likely we're going to get the deal and, and we'll get them to sign up and, and hopefully grow with them. So. The problem that it might create in some cases is the customer might have a totally different cost curve, totally misaligned with their revenue curve, which is not, yeah. And what happens is they, they are happy to take that model from you, but they'll push on price levels, which is not good for us. They'll ready. They'll they ask for huge discounts and, and price reductions. Yeah. Price model is not a, an innovation. It is like a 60 years old model like from coming from Royal Rolls Royce, right? You know that the power by the hour. They started yes. long, long back. Yeah, it is the price metric is what they started. So it's the same thing we have been using. The only thing in telecom is it, it gives us an opportunity to to use multiple price metrics in the same situation. So you have to choose the best one. Yeah. I want to jump back to, so I'm not sure if we're, if we're intermixing the words price metric and price model. In my mind, the word price metric is what am I going to charge for? And in my mind, the words price model is how do I structure the overall deal, which does include a price metric, but it probably includes other pieces as well. So one of the things you were talking about was CapEx versus OpEx or an upfront payment or a overtime payment. And, and so I, I want to jump back to thinking about a price model for a second. How do you manage offering different customers different price models? Do you as the pricing expert have to be involved in each deal? Do you teach your salespeople how to do that? How do you manage this process? It has to be the pricing person, fully trained pricing expert who will be doing creating this, customizing the, the price model to the situation, right? In the large value deals, like I said, it is highly, I mean, contextual pricing. We price to the transaction. We price to the context, rather. For each transaction, the price model could be different. Price levels are obviously different depending on the 
the value and the scope and the configuration, the time, there's so many terms and conditions. And in a way, each each transaction is unique. With so many things are different. Mm -hmm. So how good are your salespeople at telling you, here's what the situation is and being accurate? Or is this a challenge that you have to go out and talk to the customers yourselves? Sometimes we definitely, we accompany, we accompany our salespeople and talk to the customers also. But for all practical purposes, for pricing people, the salespeople are our eyes and ears. I mean, not only in telecom, any in, in industry, anyway. There are some information we can gather. There is some centralized database on the competitive intelligence, which comes from the public domain, from consultants, and also from product management centrally maintained. But that is not enough when you're working on a particular. Yeah, and, and since you brought up the concept of value conversations, this seems like it would be this type of salesperson knowing how to do a value conversation for us would be immensely valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But there are different people. We see all types of people, right? There are some people who are just eager to just respond to the customer request on price reduction, right? So they come back and they say, they just like work like messengers. And there are good people. They are very, very efficient in pushing back and then actually having a good conversation with customer and understanding exact issue. And addressing it. Many times it happened to us. I can tell you an example. It was in 2010. I was working on a deal, which is a large deal for IT operator. And that was a greenfield operator, which is a new customer. We submitted our price. And the first feedback we got is our price was three times higher than our Chinese vendors, <laughs> the other Chinese competitors. So we don't have any option. There is no way you can go and present your value, uh, value proposition or show anything. You're not going to get that much and we don't want to reduce our price the only thing is either you have to walk away or you have to propose something new and that is when we actually created a network sharing model we changed the price metric to a price per capacity and we said you don't you don't bother about the scope we will maintain it for you you focus on your your marketing you're a new operator don't spend your time on the operation of the network we'll maintain it for you fully complete end to end and you pay for the capacity that you actually use. At the same time, you allow us to provide this network as the additional capacity to another tenant. So we created a network which is multiple tenant network. So the other tenant, when we bring in the other tenant, we'll get additional money from the other customer. So it's a sharing model where customer actually paid instead of the request for 33, he agreed to pay us 40% with a condition that, and we also gave him an incentive when we bring in the second tenant, but the third tenant, the cumulative volumes will also give him additional discounts. So it's a way to encourage him to bring in more and more. So he agreed to jointly market for the additional tenant. And that's a beautiful model. And finally, we were successful. It's a more than $200 million deal. And we were successful in convincing the customer without dropping price. I mean, of course, it's not, not to that extent. There were, initially, we took some risk but overall, it was a good deal in the long term. Yeah, that sounds like a brilliant solution. And as we talked about earlier, we get paid for taking risks, right? Yeah. So, so if we're willing to take the risk and it pays off, we should make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. Usually there for every product, there is a standard product, standard price model, and a lot of alternative options, right? The alternative options always come with additional risk. That is why internally we used to say that for alternative models, additional risk, so you, you need to have additional price or a premium commensurate yep. the risk you're taking. Yeah. Right. Nice. Nice. Well, Kota, since you listen to these all the time, you know this next question's coming. What's the one piece of pricing advice you could give our listeners that you think would have a big impact on their business? Yeah, I was thinking about it. One advice, <laughs> one advice is don't let your sales people approve the price offers the pricing number one i want to give one more so the first one is in your sales process there is always a gated process right you at some point in time the offer is approved before it is submitted to the customer don't let your sales people approve your pricing number one they should be away from they are the proposers they should propose a price somebody else has to approve not price sales people i see in some cases they themselves approving 
which is not going to be a success, which is not a good way practice. Number one. Number two is you ask me one, what I'm going to give you a second. <laughs> second is most important. Bonus. Sales comp plan should always be linked to one way or other the value leakage. Value leakage or price performance. If it is linked to just the sales or profit, it is not going to work, especially in a software business. Because in software business, what is profitability? Profitability is is not very clear what because in the incremental cost of software is close to zero right so it has to be linked to the value leakage or price performance you can have some target price and price deviation or value deviation there are multiple options but it should not be the sales or profitability something else nice so we got a bonus answer on that one appreciate it <laughs> Kota, thank you so much for your time today. If anyone wants to contact you, how can they do that? Yeah, I'm active on LinkedIn and you can search me on LinkedIn as Kota Sharma. You'll find me LinkedIn. And I'm sure you're going to post the link. Yeah, his name and the link probably to his LinkedIn page will be in the show notes, so you'll be able to find it there. All right. Episode 42 in the can. I got to say my favorite part of today was talking about the pricing models and the fact that they customize the pricing model per customer. I thought that was brilliant. What was your favorite part? Please let us know in the comments or wherever you downloaded and listened. And while you're at it, would you give us a five-star review? We would hugely appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast or about pricing, feel free to email me at mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.